I am your host, Crystal Salinas McKinnon, and today we are continuing on in our series of NC-11 Congressional Race interviews with Republican candidate Rod Honeycutt, who is joining me live remotely. Uh, Colonel Honeycutt is one of four Republicans taking on incumbent Madison Cawthorn in the Republican primary. Please note that you can also view this broadcast live on Facebook or archived later on the Facebook page or WPBM website. So I believe people call you cut. Is that true? Is that accurate? Uh, yes, ma'am. I got that name uh, from the military. No one's going to call me honey. Uh, so we had to go <laughs> with the other end, go with cut. Uh, yes, ma'am. Hey, Crystal, thank you uh, and the team from WPVM, the voice of Asheville, Devine there in the control station and any of the audience listening today. Hope we have a good conversation here and spend a quality hour together. Yeah, thank you so much for being here and uh, sharing your platform and campaign with the community. So do you want to talk first off about your, tell us a little bit about yourself, your career highlights and what led you here and why you decided to jump in now? Uh, yes, ma'am. Born and raised here in Buncombe County. Uh, one of four sons, to, uh, mom and dad here. Graduated from uh, Clyde Irwin High School in 1983. Uh, joined the Army in 84. Uh, but before uh, that, I met the prettiest girl in North Buncombe at a bylaw there on Patton Avenue and had to fight a couple bag boys off. But 37 years later, still together and four sons with her uh, throughout 37 years of marriage and military career. But um, joined the Army in 84, uh, was an enlisted soldier, and then got a commission into the Army in 2000, correction, in 91, uh, after graduating from the University of South Carolina, and then went on to uh, finish master's degree at the University of Florida and the Army War College. But uh, throughout my career, I was able to command at the tactical, operational, and strategic level formations from anywhere from a couple hundred to right at 25,000, so large organizations and a leadership role. Uh, but my career culminated really over the last five years as uh, being an advisor to Congress of a role in NATO and our power projection platforms. And in November of 2018, uh, life changed as I knew it. I was in Kuwait and uh, got a tweet uh, that President Trump had sent out that we were closing Afghanistan, and that uh, immediately got me dispatched in Afghanistan to start writing the withdrawal plan that we'll cover a little bit more. Uh, but as I watched uh, this race here in NC-11 unfold last year, it piqued my interest as I got to watch uh, Madison Cawthorn and Mo Davis, and I really felt that the uh, I would like to get into that ring. And the driving factor was throughout my career, I had the opportunity to mold, teach, train, mentor uh, young men and women about Madison Cawthorn's age. And as I've watched what he's done, uh, I feel that uh, as I train those young men and women, you never walk by a mistake. And right now, I think there's a mistake that there's a lack of knowledge, maturity experience and leadership in that position. Uh, I don't think there's nothing he's asked personally, it's just his age and his experience level. And then also as I talked to those young men and women throughout my career, uh, there was basics. And one of the basics there was never pass up an opportunity to keep your mouth shut about stuff you can't have an effect on or effect on or some effect you were trying to achieve uh, that when you can't weigh in on it. I'm not telling you to walk by something. You got to, you know, represent people, but make sure it's something that you can represent people on. Um, so, as I've been out protecting democracy, this is my chance to participate in democracy, and I'm gonna give it my best shot. Yeah, I mean, I think historically we've expected our elected officials to have a college degree, has served, or had had a job. One of the three, preferably two of the three best case scenario, all three of the three. And uh, as you said, right now, we have a very young man who has none of the three. Um, how would you differentiate? Yes, Go ahead. Yes, as you look at that seat, um, we've had 21 House of Representatives throughout our history and in District 11. And 17 of those 21 have had military experience. 
uh, and I think there's some about military experience, and that's not the only thing that makes you a great leader. But I do think it brings a sense of uh, selfless service and humbleness and gives you that portfolio of experience. Uh, and our last four have not. And I'm going to reverse that trend. Uh, we're going to put someone back in there that's got that military experience and that portfolio. Uh, I'm sorry, I didn't mean to interrupt you. Oh, no, that's okay. Um, so running as a Republican, if your Democratic opponent was to be a moderate Democrat, how would you differentiate yourself? What is it about the Republican Party that you feel you most embody? And how could that translate for Democrats and independents that you would presumably hope to capture? I think you go across the whole gamut. Um, being a conservative, uh, Western North Carolina values, uh, raised with Western North Carolina amount of values. I think that when it comes to uh, the Republican stance on Second Amendment, a uh, huge advocate with brothers in law enforcement. Uh, there's no uh, defund the police type talk with me. There's no restriction of your rights uh, when it comes to First to Second Amendment. I think being, uh, I think what will set me apart will probably be my portfolio when it comes to foreign affairs, foreign service, and I think that's important, but you've got to have that is just one of the pillars of your portfolio, but you've got to be able to, to identify and relate to the men and women of Western North Carolina. I think that uh, my family's recent uh, business adventures, and I'll say recent over the last 50 years of uh, capital, as I've had parents, uh, small business owners, I've had an uncle be very successful in the PVC world and my brother is a small business owner and identifying less government and more business at the small level, uh, I think will set me apart. Um, I just think it's uh, being able to connect across all parties. Uh, I didn't grow up with anything other than could you shoot, move or communicate? I didn't ask about your race, your religion, your sex. I want to you're a good person. Are you a good American, a good citizen, being a law-abiding person? I think that's just my conservative values that'll set me apart. So you've talked, you, you already brought up uh, the Second Amendment and constitutional rights are, I believe, the first of your platform points or your issue points on your website. Um, I don't, I always joke, I don't think anybody on any side would be insane enough to run in this district and try to take people's guns away because that's just a real part of of who we are and and the people of this district um you do talk about you know wanting to or that you would support legislation pertaining to education and background checks for select citizens uh can you expound on what that means exactly yes ma'am so Back in 1978, uh, my dad gave me a Western Auto 22. That Western Auto 22 held 17 or 18 bullets. Uh, I'd go squirrel hunting with it. And back then, the first day of squirrel season was a day out of school. So you go squirrel hunting. But that same weapon system, that single 22 that held those 18 rounds was semi automatic. That's the same type of weapon that we're having discussions about today when we're talking about an AR 15 or some kind of assault weapon. Uh, it's just a little prettier of a version of that, but those weapons have been around, you know, a long time. You know, that's which auto, uh, old model, probably 1950s. Somebody will fact check, probably 1960s. I'm not sure when it was made. But the um, point is, it was a semi-automatic, 18 rounds. Uh, I was educated. Uh, my parents give me discipline and education on how to use a firearm. Uh, I think that we have misconceptions over weapons and their use. I think that if we bring people in and have an education, whether they go to the police force or the fire department or somewhere, and we just demonstrate what weapons are, uh, it really it boils down to me, it's not about the weapon. It's about the individual and individual responsibilities. Uh, trying to take the weapons away from our citizens because of irresponsible acts, uh, and something I'll never support, but absolutely support legis legislation to bring someone in and educate them about weapons. And then what, what sort of background checks would you support? 
Would you support expanding? Uh, any, you know, yes. Anytime you have a, I'm going to say a felon, uh, and that's automatic, that's no go. Uh, you can't have a weapon. Uh, somebody was demonstrated uh, character flaws, character failures in our society. And then, you know, we've got people in society who've got some mental problems, some mental illness. Uh, if that is public knowledge without getting some kind of HIPAA violation, uh, yeah, we need to take that into consideration. Uh, but it don't need to be to the point where it's a bureaucratic, we're taking months and weeks to get you okay. It's going to be a quick process. We've got to cut through the red tape with it and be responsible uh, about how we allow men and women to own firearms. Uh, we're a great nation. We can figure this out. So speaking of constitutional rights, as I'm sure you know, there's been a big shakeup in Texas recently regarding a woman's right to choose and access to uh, reproductive health care. Um, the te Texas legislature has all but banned abortions past six weeks and made no provision for cases of rape or incest. As it's common for women to not know they are pregnant prior to six weeks, some consider this a near ban. Further, the state has made a legal pathway for other citizens to sue one another. Um, in other words, you, a citizen can sue a woman for having an abortion. I know this is a very difficult subject and it's a tough question to answer, but can you share with the listeners what your reflections on this development are? Oh, absolutely. Uh, Pro-life uh, is my stance. Uh, there's nothing e either in the womb or at the end of life. Uh, Pro-life and that law in Texas overstepped its bounds when it went to the point where we can tell on a citizen for having a procedure and putting a bounty on their head. I totally disagree with that. But I am not the medical professional and I will not tell a woman how to control her body. Uh, that is not my right or any benefit that I have. However, I will not support legislation that ends a life, whether it's the beginning of life or the end of life. Uh, not going to put that's a woman and a doctor decision. Federal government should not be involved with it. I don't think the state should be involved with it. That's between a medical professional and a young lady and a young man. So it takes two. So let's just don't put it on the woman there. There's two across the board. So that's my stance on that. So just to clarify, would you vote down in Congress, for example, any law that either expanded or retracted women's rights to choose? I would not take for, I will not put federal funds towards in a life, whether at the beginning of life or the end of life. That's between a woman and her doctor without the federal government being involved in those decisions. Okay, understood. So you also said something about, you mentioned defunding the police. And so let's go into first responders and emergency essential services. Uh, I think, you know, as you said, it's pretty clear that you don't support defunding the police and statistically constituents on both sides of the aisle, white, black, et cetera, men, women do not want to defund the police. But it does seem clear that there is some sort of fractured relationship between law enforcement and various parts of our communities. How do you think that we can improve law enforcement's relationship with those whom they serve, as well as how can we as a community serve our officers as well as possible? Yes, ma'am. I think um, we got to start early in life. Uh, first of all, I think it's parents and elders in the community teaching uh, our youth to respect the police. And I think we've got to get to where uh, I, I'm going to say that we select the best to protect the rest. We have young men and women who get academic and sports scholarships, and we bring them in front of the high school, and we treat them like a rock star, and they're out doing uh, getting a college education and a free ride. We should be doing the same thing for young men and women who enter as first responders, enter as police force, enter our medical facility. 
Let's bring them in front of the community. Let's help them get an education. Let's put them in low impact jobs up front in the service that they go with, but have them commit to four or five years for that free education, whether it's a college or a tech school. But we've got to get back to respecting the police. And throughout the United States, every day, police officers touch five million individuals. That's a large number. One of those might go wrong and make national headlines, but the other 4,999,000 to go right, we don't talk about. So let's focus on the good act of our police and not focus on the negative aspect of our police. Okay. Uh, so as you know, you probably know Asheville in particular is I think functioning at about 66% in the police department. So we've had massive attrition and so it sounds like you have some interesting ideas about how to incentivize people to join and to make it more attractive of a job. Because uh, I recently heard somebody, I believe the police chief in Hendersonville said that how can he find guys when Chick-fil-A is paying them more? Uh, yes, so, ma'am. So there's got to be incentive. There's got to be incentives. And, you know, you could take it generational. Uh, you have a police officer who gets a salary, but because he's a state employee, let's help him out with tuition at a college for his children, for their families. There's all kinds of things we could go through uh, and help uh, families, you know, and maybe it's the, the workload is one thing, but it's the respect they get in the community is another. And we've got to, and there was a billboard out here on Patton Avenue thanking the police here recently. We've got to get more uh, slap on the backs and appreciative than the ah shucks moments that we see in the news. It's about, these are great Americans. Uh, you know, our country was founded on Christian Judeo laws and we are a Christian uh, country founded on those laws. And we got to respect those laws. If not, we're going to go into anarchy and get into a place where it's lawlessness and we got to get away from it. So there's got to be discipline uh, in our family units, discipline in our communities. And it's more than just the police. It's the local community leaders back in the police uh, to make sure that it's seen as one team, one fight. Have you heard of the of David Hurley, who's running for sheriff of Buncombe County? Oddly enough, he's running, I believe, as a Democrat, but he's also subscribes to the constitutional sheriff ideology. Are you familiar with that? No, I don't know Mr. Hurley, but I could guess the constitutional thing, uh, probably not tied to government, tied to individual, something like that, but I don't know. No, ma'am, I'm don't. i not familiar with it. Okay, all right, we'll just move on. I just was curious if, you know, if you had heard anything about that, because it's kind of curious. Um, so, okay. What, let's see, all right, veterans, so... I think we all know that our veterans need more. Do you want to talk about what you would, what the biggest concerns you see for veterans to be as you are yourself a veteran and what can we do to help our veterans? Yes, ma'am. So I entered the, uh, the veteran world there on one July. And I can tell you that our Asheville Veterans Center is world class. Uh, I was immediately taken in, immediately given my primary care provider. And I couldn't have asked for a better in integration as an initial. Uh, but as we look at uh, the stress, and we can tie this into Afghanistan, how Afghanistan has created a stressful moment for our veterans here as we watch this unfold, especially as we get into 9-11 uh, and Patriots Day and what it means to all of us. But for our veterans, mental illness and homeless rate, uh, we know, and along with suicides, uh, has skyrocketed. And right now it's centralized to the VA. I would like to see something where we decentralize that and we have veterans sponsoring veterans, where we could have a veteran subsidized to bring a veteran off the street, spend six months with them or up to a year and get them on a path of solid, uh, foundation of moving towards a job, getting mental health, getting your VA benefits straight. And I think it's got to be more personalized. 
uh, at a local level. The VA is a big organization here in Asheville uh, and in a little satellite out there in Franklin. But we've got to break it up into a much more manageable uh, piece and get away from the big part. And I'd love to see some kind of legislation where I could go and find a homeless person, a veteran who's homeless, get him into some kind of Airbnb that has a job benefit for the Airbnb owner to get them into that. There's six months of job training. Just get them back on their feet. I think there's some uh, operational room there to explore this. And I think we need to move out as a nation, uh, taking care of our veterans. Yeah, make it, a, break it out into bite-sized pieces, help them navigate how to re-enter civilian life, et cetera. So your yes, next thing- Yes, man, I want to hit on Afghanistan real quick. Uh, there's a lot of young men and women who feel di disenfranchised right now over what we saw in the fold. Uh, I want to make sure that they understand that 20 years of commitment in Afghanistan, uh, that was 20 years of worth our national treasure to happen. Uh, there are 20 years of young men and women in Afghanistan who knows what freedom is. Uh, you're not going to be able to put that back in the box. Uh, the Taliban is going to have to deal with uh, those freedoms. Uh, so as you lay down your head at night and you think about uh, your friends that didn't come back and the wounds that we suffered as uh, we participated in that 20 years, it was what our nation asked us to do. And it was the right thing to do. Uh, and we have made a strategic mistake by leaving. Uh, and we'll talk about that in a minute, I'm sure. But on, when you look back at your Afghanistan uh, experience, know that your country loves you and appreciates what you've done. And more importantly, the world is still going to look at America for doing the right thing and trying to prosecute and successfully prosecuting the people who perpetrated that act on 9-11 uh, we've got that blood back uh, that they spilt uh, on 9-11. Well, so speaking of this, you're, I, you, I hear you saying we should not have left, at least when we did or how we did. There have been some dire consequences. Where did we go wrong? How could we have done it differently? So uh, as I was in Kuwait in November when that, tweet came out from President Trump that says, uh, we're leaving Afghanistan. Uh, I immediately went to Afghanistan as a senior army logistician, and we developed uh, three courses of actions uh, to leave Afghanistan. We had a small length, a medium length, and a long length over a period of time. And we were negotiating uh, with the Taliban. Uh, we were feeding the Doha Cutter peace talks of how long it would take to close the forward operating bases around the country. And we had agreements in place, and they kept those agreements in place. But where I think we got, uh, not where I think, where we got desynchronized was between the Department of Defense and the Department of State, uh, operating on two different uh, timelines. The President Biden's decision to use September 11th as an arbitrary date or some kind of ceremonial date to leave was a mistake. Uh, he accepted the hand President Trump developed. Uh, he's now in the seat. He's in charge. He could have reshuffled that deck and changed that date, uh, knowing that we had that equipment left in Afghanistan. Now, there physically was not enough military assets or commercial assets to get that equipment out of Afghanistan by September 11th or September 1st. But the thing uh, that's not been talked about was that equipment was authorized and funded and approved by Congress for Afghanistan. It was not uh, for a Title 10 soldier. It was to develop the Afghan National Army and the Afghan National Police. So in the equation, uh, we've got to look back at accountability procedures throughout Congress. How do we get to the point where we funded it and to leave it there? And we started the withdrawal plan. There was no oversight. Uh, from Congress. You know, the military works for Congress. We have civilian masters. So there was failures at every level. Uh, so we can't just say, hey, you know, the executive did it. There was failures at every level. But doing it better, it should have been 
mission analysis is a continual process. Uh, we should have had marks on the wall that said, we cannot get there, uh, let's back up. Um, and I think that's where we fail. But it's much larger than just failure to withdraw. We have now left a country in Afghanistan that is surrounded by six other countries and three of those other countries are nuclear powers. Uh, we have left a space there for now terrorism to be planned. We've left operational space for China and Russia to come in. So it was much larger than just the equipment issue. It's we have lost a strategic platform that allowed our national defense to provide multiple dilemmas uh, in multiple lanes that is now gone. Well, speaking of China, um, <clears throat> now that the Taliban is in power, they're being treated like legitimate heads of state by China. Um, they've already begun their Belt and Roads Initiative in the region, and they are making overtures to greatly expand this in cooperation with the Taliban. Um, so much so that the Taliban promised to abandon aid to the Uyghur people in the Xinjiang province as part of the deal so that they could further their economic growth with China. Do you think that this is a form of imperialism on the part of China? What kind of threat does this pose to the United States? So China desires to be the Middle Kingdom. Uh, that was a geographical uh, term originally, but has now become like we are wedded to democracy, a flag, and the Constitution. They are wedded to becoming the Middle Kingdom, and they are going to spread the Middle Kingdom out um, to help open lines of communication lines of communication for transportation, whether it's by sea or land, and you're seeing them do that in Afghanistan. Uh, you're also seeing them do it in Africa. Uh, you're seeing them do it around the world. They're not looking at their funding constraints. They're being unlimited in their constraints to spend dollars to expand their nation's economy. Uh, as we step back from different roles in the world, they step into it. Uh, I was in the Philippines during a typhoon when China actually beat the U.S. to providing aid uh, because they wanted to be the leaders and they wanted to show the world that they were responsive. We've got to get back to being the leaders and having everyone else look up to us uh, following our examples. We can't take second seat uh, to any other country. But to answer your question, yes, imperialism, uh, that's what they're trying to get after. That is their um middle kingdom campaign and they're going after it they're going after it hard so they do in your opinion represent an economic threat to us certainly china oh yeah. oh yes uh, economic threat uh, china yes, china is an economic threat uh, and if you look at um how they're doing it uh, and they're doing it multiple ways if you go to Pacific Theater, uh, go into South China Seas, of how they're trying to restrict movement, even though the United Nations Conventions for Laws of the Sea has told China you cannot restrict movement, they're trying their best to build up a military fleet to restrict our movement. And we've got to stay dominant, uh, regardless of the theater, because their economic growth will depend on their military success in the South China Sea and in Afghanistan and in Africa. So yes, they will be an economic threat, uh, but they're not going to be a military threat because uh, we've got the best military in the world and we've got to thank uh, President Trump uh, in his administration that he made our nuclear triad uh, the best it could be. Uh, whether it land, sea, or air, uh, and we have, uh, we're formidable, and they don't want to mess with the United States. So do you believe that our, as far as our relationship, the United States goes with the world, that we are and should function as a moral authority? Yes, I'd hope every country would want that, uh, to be a moral authority, but yes, ma'am. Uh, we should be uh, a moral authority, a moral example. If you look through the levers of our country, whether it's dip 
diplomatic information, military, economic. Our information uh, lever is built upon the fact that other countries see us as a country to follow, uh, an example to follow. And you've got to have the moral rights, um, not just deeds and words. They got to be synchronized and integrated together. Uh, but yes, ma'am, I think that we should be seen that way. All right. So let's go back to the platform then, and we can talk about economy, since it seems like a reasonable segue. Um, you say on your website, our citizens must go to work, individual stimulus checks and unemployment benefits is enabling a work bri bridal environment and incentivizing staying at home. Obviously, just recently here, all those benefits have more or less gone away. So do you expect to see a huge surge of folks returning to the workforce? Ma'am, there should be. When we've got uh, drive through fast food restaurants that they can't have enough employees in it to stay open, but we've got people at home uh, drawing checks, that, that's backwards. Uh, we've got to get people to work uh, and grow our economy. Small businessmen uh, need employees. Uh, I've been out and about uh, throughout all the 17 counties, and it's a theme you hear. Can't get enough people to come to work. Uh, can't go into a store because it's shutting down because people don't want to work. We've incentivized staying at home. That's got to stop. Uh, we've got to get back to a uh, hard day's work for a hard day's pay uh, and not sitting at home getting a hard day's pay. Uh, that's not what we're about as America. Capitalism got us to where we're at uh, and we've got to get back to it and get the country to work. Um, you've got some segments of our society that's overworked. Uh, because of what's going on in the world, especially with our COVID. And we've got to figure out how to incentivize get people back to work. And part of it is salary, uh, but part of it is you just got to be motivated. You got to get up and go to work and not expect a handout. What would you say to folks who are <clears throat> not working either due to childcare issues or um, their own concerns about COVID because perhaps they're particularly vulnerable, et cetera. And, you know, same with the childcare. Some people cannot, are not sending their kids back to school because of COVID concerns. Uh, yes, ma'am. And it's individual. Uh, you've got to have an individual choice, an individual right, whether it's mask or vaccination. Uh, but your family's welfare uh, should not be put in jeopardy because you're at fear. So I think that as employers, uh, we've got to figure out how to put our employees back to work, whether they do it from home, how we change the work settings to be more COVID compliant or environmentally compliant so we don't have people getting sick. Uh, I worked on a staff of about 1,700 people. Uh, we had to divide that staff up into a third during the day, a third in the evening, and a third virtual with an hour in between each shift. You had to clean the workstations before you came in. And we were very successful in fighting COVID, but it takes discipline and, and it takes a little bit of inconvenience on everybody's part, but uh, man, there's ways to get around it. And you've just got to, employers and employees have got to get together and figure out what's best. You know, there's no cookie cutter answer. Uh, whether it's a small shop or a large shop, uh, you've got to figure out how to get compliant, how to get people back to work and get this country going back again. What do you think about Madison Cawthorn showing up at the Buncombe County School Board meeting to support the parents protesting the children being required to wear masks to school? Well, I think he absolutely had a right to be there. Um, I have a son that's in Buncombe County, so I definitely have an opinion uh, of the mask issue. You know, he is a um, member of the county, uh, so he, he's got to be there. He can voice his opinion like anybody else. I don't think that his office can weigh in either way, left or right. Uh, it's elected officials in all 17 counties making those decisions, but everyone has the right to go there and voice their opinion. But as a House of Representatives, uh, that's a that's not in his wheelhouse. But applaud him for making his uh, opinion known. 
but as far as adjusting what a state does or what that county school board does, now I don't I'm not sure the influence he would have on that at that seat. Uh, me personally, I have spoken to the school boards around the 17 counties just one on one versus making it in a public uh, spectacle. We'll say that is happening to some of them because I think you can work one on one and have a conversation, understand both sides versus getting into yelling match and screaming and calling names. Uh, that's just not the kind of person I am. I'm going to get to the solution, but I'm going to get to the solution in a manner that is an adult manner and in a manner that has maturity, experience of leadership behind it. So do you think though that people spreading misinformation, whether it be Cawthorn or whether it be anybody is that's causing other folks to be confused about the vaccine and about the mask and about the efficacy of it. And therefore we continue to have COVID continues to be an enormous problem, which is most likely playing a huge role in folks not returning to work. Um, so do you think it's damaging to spread information, discouraging children, for example, who can't be vaccinated anyway from wearing masks? Well, yeah, of course, disinformation is going to be damaging uh, regardless of how it comes out, whether it's disinformation about our political process or medical process. Anytime you've got disinformation, it's going to be damaging. Uh, I've had uh, advisors throughout my career, culinary arts advisors, medical advisors, legal advisors. Uh, and as the leader, you have to make a decision which advice you're going to follow and how you're going to. And as an individual citizen, you've got to decide which advice you're going to follow. Uh, and I think that this information is absolutely wrong. But there is such a blurred line right now over what is medically right, medically wrong, uh, depending on who you talk to, which medical. To, there's medical experts that's going to say the mask is not good. There's medical experts that's going to say the mask is good. I think that uh, you've got to go back to individual choices and individual responsibility and determine what's right for your family. But no, ma'am, spreading disinformation, uh, if it's proven disinformation fact, uh, it, it's, there's no place for it. There's no place for it in our political uh, space. There's no place, space for it in our human space. Uh, we just got to get back to what are the facts and making sure that everyone understands them. Because right now there's a lot of misinformation out there. All right, let's move on to the environment. Um, you do assert that it's important to you that we protect our planet. What is your stance on climate change in general? Do you believe that it's caused by man? I struggle with that one. Uh, I think 90% of the world's covered in water and 10% has land and how that 10% is affecting the rest of the world. You know, I know the guy that controls the thermostat and I believe he's in charge. Uh, I'm pretty sure that uh, we have some impact on it, but um, I don't think that our government should be the one deciding which type of fuel that we use, whether it's uh, wind, uh, using the water, or using the sunlight. Uh, I think we shouldn't be, the government shouldn't be determined that. Uh, I've got to watch uh, solar. It's probably the one I'm most comfortable with. I was able to watch DOD installations uh, put up solar panels and completely unplug from the power grid. So I know that it has been successful. And as we look at uh, resiliency in our power grid and having that resiliency and that redundancy, I think having that backup for uh, solar or another type of uh, power generation is critical. Uh, to make sure that we just have our infrastructure in place. But uh, yes, man, we got to be good stewards. Uh, and I believe that is incumbent upon us all to be good stewards. But uh, the government shouldn't be deciding what it is. That should be the businessmen and women of America deciding which one of the natural resources we use to augment uh, our power grid. Do you think that the free market, though, has shown thus far? an ability to protect the environment or course correct us? 
you know, I look at um, our carbon footprint, and if you look around the world, our carbon footprint, I'm sure there's been reductions. I think we've, we've gotten better at it. I think there's always going to be room for improvement. So I'm going to say yes, uh, but always more, uh, there's always room for improvement regardless of what it is. I think that uh, was it the Paris Peace Accord, uh, where we talked about the environment, I think we got to be good stewards and be part of that uh, and show that we are doing our best to leave a world for our children uh, that they will inherit is healthy. Uh, so yes, ma'am, but always room for improvement. Okay. So the next thing on your platform is national security. We've already kind of touched upon that. Do you want to expand on that at all? Beyond what we so talked national about security is, Afghanistan and Yes, ma'am. So our national security, uh, Afghanistan was a strategic failure, but it, it really, you've got to open up the aperture much wider uh, as we look at it. Because, you know, we're bringing in a lot of immigrants out of Afghanistan, vetted immigrants coming in out of Afghanistan. Uh, so our borders uh, are important. Our southern border is very important as we look for the northern triangle countries and how we stop the illegal drug flow and human trafficking coming in. But it's also our east and west borders now, uh, as especially as we've left um, a space for terrorists to operate in. So I think it is much broader than just uh, that southern border. And as we look at how Congress is going to apply this infrastructure bill, we've got to make sure that our infrastructure uh, is linked to our homeland defense. So as we look for power projection platforms on the east or west coast, uh, we've got to make sure that we got rail, we've got roads, uh, we, we've got the right launching platforms uh, to project around the world. So I think that it's all tied. You can't look at just one. They're all tied together. And I think you've got to have that portfolio uh, as you're a congressman to look at those uh, and not be just centered on one border, centered on all of them. But our decisions have got to be nested with our Western North Carolina values and that we're representing the men and women as we're carrying forward how we want our infrastructure and how we want our national defense to look from the mountains of Western North Carolina. Do you think that, do, well, do you support the infrastructure bill on that note? No, ma'am. In the way it was written, no, ma'am. Uh, it was too big. Uh, $5.2 trillion or something was the dollar amount that came out of it. No, ma'am. It was too big. Uh, I was surprised that the uh, gentleman on the other side of the aisle, 19 Republicans endorsed it. Uh, that caught me a little bit by surprise. Uh, it, it's too big. And I think we're trying to mortgage a little bit of our future for our children for today. I think there was things that... Um, needed to be looked at and I can't give you the specifics on them. I've read this massive like 1100 page document that this thing looks like. And it's just so cumbersome of a bill that one person or group of people can't manage it. I think it was too big. It was uh, unwilderly and we've got to bring it back in, but I'm afraid that it's going to pass and we're going to have to look at how we apply it now and make sure that we are using it as good stewards, regardless of the area that we use it in. Okay. So back to immigration, and obviously it ties very closely to national security. Um, you're pretty clear that you, you know, only support legal immigration, folks going through the proper channels. But at the same time, we know that that system is very slow and very backed up. And we also know that immigrants play an important part in our economy. So how do you think that we could find a win-win here that is both humane and safe? Yes, I think it comes there at that, uh, the point of need, right there as you cross that border, uh, that long process, that point of need has got to be reduced, whether it's a virtual uh, hearing to determine whether or not you can come in and it's 24 hours operational. But I think that it's pretty easy checklist uh, 
yes, I qualify, or no, I don't qualify. Yes, I qualify, you go into one lane and you come into the U.S. and we integrate you. If it's no, I don't qualify, it's immediately go back. And the immediate ability to immediately cross into the United States, we've got to look at that. Uh, I think that there are circumstances where we could stop them short of the border and the countries that surround us has a responsibility also and not just using us as a funnel to get through uh, but they've got to take a little bit of responsibility and helping uh, the rest of the world control that and not just thinking that the u.s is going to be the catch-all so do you think though that we could still make i mean could we make it more efficient somehow because right now it's not people are just in these holding areas for really extended periods of time. Yes, ma'am. And I think it goes back to it. it could we put virtual uh, courtrooms together where you're in front of a camera and you're in front of a judge and they're determined it and how long you're there. And then it's, you know, it, it's a quick process versus as long as catch, you know, not catching release. If you get released uh, into the interior of the United States, that's not the right answer. Uh, you should be immediately released in the interior of the United States. There should be a immediate process that helps determine whether you go in or not. And it's assets. To me, it's human capital assets with the decision-making authority to say yes or no on the spot. Uh, putting it down at a future date for you to come back to a court, it's a non-starter. Uh, it, it's got to be immediate. And really, the application process should be an indicator. If your application is approved for you to go through, all right, then there's probably merit for you to go to a court virtually. If it's not approved, well, then you shouldn't be at the border. That's where I believe that the other countries should step up and say, your application was not approved, you know, virtually. And for those who are just showing up without a virtual application, you got to work through that on the, at the point of need. But yes, ma'am, it's got to be streamlined. And I think uh, virtual plus on hand um, is the way to go. Okay. Let's talk about health care. I'm going to take a leap and assume you don't support Medicare for all, but I think it's pretty obvious that we do have a problem in this country and in this district in particular with health care. Do you have any plans or thoughts on how we can close the gap for folks who are either uninsured or underinsured? Uh, yes, I'm not as personal. Um, we lost my dad six weeks ago. And after he paid into Social Security and Medicare, Medicaid for 64 years, as he got to the end of his life, I started to get notifications that he was no longer qualified, no longer insured. Uh, there's something wrong right there as we get into the end of a person's life and we can't help them. And we've got insurance companies fighting uh, to send a person home out of a hospital, out of a facility. That's one. Uh, and the second one is, We've got a big district here, uh, 17 counties, our far counties out in the West, um, very limited healthcare facilities. We've got to come up with mobile facilities, uh, rotational facilities, and have uh, incentives for the hospitals to send their care providers out there to help the men and women. I think that it's uh, part of that infrastructure money uh, should go towards our healthcare whether it's a brick and mortar facility or a rotational mobile facility that is known and predictable. Uh, but yes, ma'am, we've got to work through that as a nation. Uh, and the taking care of our citizens uh, is got to be the first we can do unto others what hasn't been doing under us and take care of each other. And the insurance has got to get away from looking at dollars and looking at who can get their pockets lined and get it back to, let's take care of each other. Well, it doesn't that sort of imply that more regulation is needed or more government intervention? Chris, I got you. I said, doesn't what you're saying kind of lend itself to the fact that we need more regulation or more government intervention? No, ma'am. I think that the federal funds should be there, but it should be at the state. I think your connection. No, ma'am. I, I don't down. think that's what I'm trying to get. I'm trying to get across. Mm -hmm. All right, can you hear me? Yeah. 
Crystal, you got me back? I, I can hear you. You're you're in and out a little, but I can hear you. Well, we just lost Mr. Honeycutt. Give him a second, see if he comes back. All right, well, I'm gonna go ahead and wrap up then. And uh, we will have Colonel Honeycutt return to finish up at another time. So once again, you've been listening to WPBM 103.7 on your dial and globally at WPBMFM.org. Thank you again to NC11 Republican Congressional Candidate Rod Honeycutt for joining me today to share his campaign and platform with the community. Um, you can find more information about Honeycutt at cut, C-U-T-T, for F-O-R, congress.com. And don't forget that you can view this broadcast archived on WPVM's Facebook page or website. Tune in for upcoming candidate interviews on WPVM with Republican candidate Bruce O'Connell and Democratic candidate Eric Gash. Please note that you can also view past candidate interviews archived on the WPVM Facebook page and website. Thank you again and stay tuned.